I'm Terry Powell. I work at Berkeley Lab. If you are here to discuss the university's biofuels program, this is the wrong evening for that discussion. None of the speakers on alternative energy sources is here this evening. Tonight's program is about our universe and the experiments that gave evidence of the Big Bang Theory. Our speaker is Nobel Laureate and Professor George Smoot. I would like to take this time to acknowledge and thank our co-sponsors for this Science at the Theater series. The University of California, Berkeley, Chabot Space and Science Center, the Exploratorium, and science departments in our local high schools in Berkeley, Albany, and Oakland, as well as our wonderful host theater, Berkeley Repertory Theater. George Smoot was born in Florida and raised in Alabama, Alaska, and Ohio. And he learned to like to travel, I think. With a father, a hydrologist, and his mother, a science teacher, he developed a respect for learning and a great interest in science and math. George pursued these interests at MIT, gaining both BS degrees in mathematics and physics and a PhD in physics in 1970. George came to Lawrence Berkeley Lab soon after and began working with Nobel laureate Louis Alvarez and his group on experiments to find evidence of the Big Bang. In October 2006, George Smoot was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics together with John Mather of NASA Goddard Space Flight Center for the discovery of the black body form and anisotropy of the cosmic microwave background radiation. Today, he is most famous for this research, thought to be the relic of the intense heat of the early Big Bang. George's honors, besides the Nobel Prize in Physics, include the Medal of the Einstein Society, NASA's Medal for Exceptional Science Achievement, the Kilby Award for his contributions to science and technology, and the Department of Energy's own Ernest Orlando Lawrence Award. George has also published a popular book on cosmology entitled Wrinkles in Time. His talk tonight is on the Big Bang, Kobe, and the relic radiation traces of creation. George? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I'm glad to uh, have a chance to talk at the Berkeley Repertory Theater, and uh, so I'm glad you came out tonight. So you saw Kobe flying around. I want you to know it's still flying around 14 times a day since 1989, at the end of, end of 1989. And uh, with it, we made a map of the, of the embryo universe, and that started us on a path. It was sort of a major milestone on a path of understanding our universe. And so I have a whole bunch of slides to go through, so I'm going to go fast and uh, show you some pictures. But first, I want to show you what the universe looks like now, if my computer responds. So, uh, can you guys see this, or the lights need to turn down a little bit? Can we have the lights a little lower? OK, so what you should see on here is the Hubble deep, Ultra Deep Field, and you should see galaxies. You should recognize the spiral galaxy and elliptical galaxy and so forth. This is what the sky looks like sort of nearby. Hubble is pretty far away, but it's still relatively nearby in what we're talking about. And the question is, this map that I showed you at the beginning, whoops, go one more back. This map in the background, actually, if you were looking at it through contrast, would just look uniform. And yet, there's just these tiny ripples on it. They're about a part in 100,000. And yet, when we look at the modern universe, we see all this structure. And as far as we can see, there's mostly nothing out there with some galaxies smattered in between. And so the question is, how did the universe get from that state to this state? Or do we not understand what's going on? And we think we understand very well. We have a model, which we call our standard model of cosmology, in which the universe starts from such a tiny thing that quantum mechanics, quantum fluctuations are very important. It goes through a tremendous period of expansion and expands by about 30 orders of magnitude or more, extremely a large amount. And so it's shown sort of graphically on here as a, a, a rapid expansion. And then from this point, from, well, from about this point, 
on to that point. It's another 30 years of magnitude, but the graph paper isn't big enough, so we kind of show it. And so we're making a picture of the universe back at this epoch, and 14 billion years have go by where the universe is expanding and gravity is working its magic. And eventually we get the stars and the galaxies and you know, other things like these ceremony that some of you saw the pictures of. They, uh, you know, it's pretty uh, impressive uh, sort of an array of stuff. And the, the story starts as, well, in a reasonable way, back 40 years ago in uh, 1965 when Pinsley and Wilson working at Bell Labs trying to understand how bright the sky might be so people could make phone calls, uh, discovered what we call the relic radiation from the Big Bang, or sometimes the cosmic microwave background radiation, or earlier in the universe, the cosmic background radiation, because you go earlier, the universe is smaller and the radiation is compressed more and is hotter, so it's no longer in the microwaves. So here's a picture of Penzias and Wilson about 13 years after the discovery, by the time they got the Nobel Prize. Here's the anten famous antenna they did. Here's a picture of somebody fixing it up to make sure it wasn't coming from the equipment but, and so forth. And there's a long sort of lore about, you know, Penzias talked to a radio astronomer, Bernie Burke, who talked to Peebles, who was just down the road, and the people at Princeton were working on it. There's a whole long story uh, of the interconnections and so forth. But this was the point at which people knew there was a candidate a relic from the beginning of the universe, something that would tell us about it. And I heard about it, and I was a young undergraduate when I heard about this. And, uh, but when I was a beginning grad student just down the hall, for, just down the road from me, I was at MIT, down the road from me was a grad student just about to finish up, Joe Silk, who was working at Harvard, and uh, he wrote this paper and gave this talk in uh, 1967 about the fluctuations in the primordial fireball. And if you read this, you will say, it'll see it in here. The interpretation if, of being cosmological implies fluctuations can't condense. And this was a, uh, a kind of a, this whole talk and paper were kind of a watershed for me because not only was there evidence there was relic radiation from the Big Bang, but he showed what an important role it has. As the universe gets, as you go backward in time, the universe is smaller the wavelengths get shorter, and the temperature of the radiation gets hotter. So if you go back when the universe is a thousand times smaller than now, the entire universe was as hot as the sun. But if you go back another factor of a thousand, it's a thousand times hotter than the sun. And if you go back another thousand, it's a million times, you know, it's a thousand times hotter than the sun, a million times, and so on. You, you find that if you put anything in the universe, it's instantly vaporized, torn to shreds, and spread uniformly across the map. And so the problem is when the early universe is full of this hot radiation, it dominates everything, it blows everything apart. How can we explain how there could be galaxies and things to form? And so you'll see in here, he said, you know, the question is, are these primordial perturbations going to survive the, the, the primordial fireball to an epoch when galaxy formation is possible? And so since there were galaxies, I knew that this radiation was going to either be very important, either it didn't come from the Big Bang and it was something else, or if you observed it, and, and you could see it, you would see the fluctuations in the primordial fireball that would tell you about the formation of galaxies. And so I started paying attention, but I had to finish my thesis and do other things, but I eventually did uh, other things. So let me explain to you about the CMB. And uh, it comes from extremely early time, the cosmic microwave background that we see today, the cosmic background radiation when it started out. It started out when the universe, to, towards us, when the universe was about 380,000 years old. Now it seems pretty old, but remember, it's 4 billion, 14 billion years later. So in a human lifespan, conception is here, birth is there. 12 hours afterwards is about when you're taking the snapshot. Okay? So it really is the embryo universe in terms of human going on. Or put it in terms of a marathon. If you, you're starting or ending a marathon, it's just four feet into the marathon. I mean, it's not, not very far, right? I mean, and, and, and the marathon for the universe isn't over, right? We're just at the whatever part that we happen to be, uh, at least got another factor of 10 at least. So we're taking a picture of the universe when it's extreme, when we're probing this, we're probing the universe when it's very young, and when we make images of it, we're making image of it when it was simply an embryo. And in fact, we have ways of looking back even further. Okay, so how did we get started? Well, Joe Silk uh, finished, you know, wrote that paper in 67. He came here as a professor in early 1970. Uh, and I came not longer, not long after that as a new postdoc. And uh, at that time, Professor Richards was working with Charlie Towns, 
decided he would think about the stuff that Joe Silk was telling him about and think about doing the experiment to measure the spectrum of the microwave background. And he eventually took on graduate students John Mather and Dave Woody. And John Mather later on, first I met him there, but later on became a collaborator on the COBE satellite and so forth. And so what happened in here at Berkeley was the development of the bolometers and the Michelson interferometer, which I'll mention later, which were a precursor to the experiment on COBE, which measures the spectrum of the background radiation which in the Big Bang Theory should be perfectly thermal. It should be the same thing that Planck uh, proposed years ago. I began working on the anisotropy and polarization in 1974 and started this long wavelength spectrum in 77. And in the meantime, we had competition on the East Coast, uh, starting with the people at Princeton. Peebles and Dickey were motivating them. Dave Wilkinson was running a group doing experiments. And then Ray Weiss moved from Princeton to MIT and started working with Dirk, Mul Dirk Muller to try and make these measurements. So we had an East Coast, West Coast sort of uh, competition collaboration going on, as you will see. So here's a picture of Dave Wilkinson and his apparatus sitting on White Mountain, which is on the California-Nevada border. In the time frame, roughly 67 or 69, he came a couple different summers. And you can see three different uh, instruments, radio receivers he made to try and measure the spectrum of the microwave background to see if it was thermal. And he here's what it actually looks like set up. You have to put grounds, you know, there's the, the sort of temporary house in the back, but there's ground screens around it, a horn looking at the sky, and a horn that looks down at a reference load. And I'll explain why we do that. That is, in the cosmic microwave background, we're seeking a very small signal and a very large background, uh, plus the noise. So the anisotropy signals that people anticipated in the 1970s were at one thousandth of a Kelvin level, right? The C and B temperature is roughly three Kelvin, so this is already a thousand to one. But the receiver temperatures and the Earth's temperature are around 300 Kelvin in terms of effective noise or a random signal that it produces. And so we're already at a point where the signal is about a millionth uh, of, the, of the backgrounds that we're trying to sort it out from. And so it's like being in, in the theater here and having everybody yelling and screaming and me whispering on stage and you're trying to listen, right? It's, it's that kind of a problem. So we have to develop some techniques. First, we compare with signals of the same level. And for measuring the spectrum, you want to look at something as close as 3 Kelvin. Compare the sky temperature with a load that's about 3 Kelvin, which was how Pinsons and Wilson were able to do it. They used liquid helium, which is normal temperature uh, at, at standard uh, pressure of about uh, 4.2 Kelvin, so they didn't have to. The other thing you have to do is exclude, reject, average out, and get rid of all the other sources and signals in various ways. And so we had developed techniques to do that. So when I was working on, just to give you an idea, here's a contrast of one to one, and it's already tough, a million to one, right? It's kind of hard to pick the signal out, so you have to be really careful. So we had to develop a tool which we call a differential microwave radiometer which the engineer shortened to DMR uh, really quickly. So you'll basically see DMR. And the trick here is something that Dickey had thought of in the 1940s, which is if you have receivers that are wandering all over the map, electronics wasn't so good in the 1940s, as you can imagine. If you ever saw the movie Radio, you'll, you'll know that things don't work so well. So if you have your receiver chain and you're trying to, to measure some high frequency signal and you, you run it down to try and observe it, what you find is it wanders all over the map. And so what we thought we would do is have two identical antennas, look at the signal from the sky here and the signal from the sky in that direction, and switch the receiver back and forth rapidly between them. So this is an up improved version of what Dickey had for what was called the Dickey switched radiometer. And so here's the prototype of the radiometer in the, in the laboratory. Two standard gain horns, a, a switch, an isolator, and the various stages where you do the amplification. And then what you do is you look at how quickly you're switching back and forth, and you look for a step in the signal that way. And so as long as you're switching back and forth very rapidly, the receiver drift isn't very important. You just look for steps that are happening, and then the steps are waving up and down as your equipment changes. But now you have to make sure things are identical, so one of the things you have to do is rotate the antennas around. Okay, so that's, you know, that's the short end of it. It's actually hard. You have to do it carefully and then so forth. So one of the problems you have to solve is the problem of making sure the radiation you're getting is something that you want to get. So here's a plot in polar coordinates. This direction is the main lobe of the beam, and this is the response down by a factor of 10, down by a factor of 100, down by a factor of 1,000, down by 10 to the fourth. And this is what you get with a standard gain horn. In the one plane, called the E plane, you see it has horrible lobes in all directions. Well, horrible if you worry about a part in 1,000, but we're worried about a part in a million, so we have to worry about it. 
But in the H-plane, you'll see it's very smooth. And that has to do with the basic diffraction or properties of electromagnetism. And so eventually, I explored around, and we found a, a solution, which is called a corrugated horn. And it has very low side lobes. And you'll see 10 to the minus 1, 100, 1,000, 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. Turns out we needed most of this in the end, so that in the direction we're looking, we have unit response as soon as we get 30, 40 degrees off axis, we've been able to knock the signal way down. It means we can't have everything, anything in the beam that's like the Earth, which is 300 degrees compared to looking for a millikelvin, right? So that's the, the sort of issue. So then we had the, the technique to make a radiometer system to map the background radiation, and we documented this in a paper in 1978, although the project was quite far along. So I'll show you a picture of Mark Gorenstein a little later while we're working on an experiment. But I had collaborators, Rich Muller, uh, myself, Tony Tyson, and you heard about Louis Alvarez. Whoops, I should have changed the colors here. We had key engineers and technicians who helped us out. John uh, Among, Hal Doherty, John Gibson, uh, Robbie Smith, John Yamada, a number of other people. And that was key, the fact that there were people like that at Berkeley we could call upon in order to, do, in order to build our equipment and make it work uh, really well. So here's the, the substantiation. We actually have two receivers. Here's the corrugated horns. There's a one centimeter wavelength uh, radiometer. So when we talk microwaves, we're talking about you know, wavelengths at one centimeter. The microwave that some of you saw the picture of earlier, that's a 12 centimeter wavelength. So it's, this is 10 times the frequency, basically. And this is an atmospheric monitoring one. It used the standard gain horn. So these are all co-located co co so we could make sure we were not seeing the atmosphere. We were actually seeing the sky. And then we have a rotation system in order to rotate it around. Then we set this in in a container to keep the stray signals away, so it's all it controls the metal. And now you see it sitting in an airframe. I had been flying on balloons and had bad experience. My equipment didn't always come back, sometimes, or it came back, it came back, came back kind of crushed up. And uh, so we put it, we decided we would fly in an airplane. So here's what it looks like when it's in the airfoil in the data taking position. You have the two antennas pointing out flush with the air surface the two atmospheric monitoring antennas there. And then when it was getting ready for takeoff and landing or not being used, it stowed. Things are rotated 90 degrees, and there are two plugs that fill up the hole. So what airplane, what airplane did we use? We used this airplane. Some of you who are old enough will know what this is. This is a U-2 jet. This was famous for making flights from Turkey to Scandinavia uh, during the height of the Cold War until uh, one of them crashed. and. Uh, uh, in that case, then one of them became available to NASA Ames in order to be able to do Earth resources. Eventually, they got two. And here are all the various experiments sitting out on the tarmac. And you will see all of them are downward looking, because the plane was designed to fly very high and very stably and take beautiful pictures. So it's up higher than any Soviet jets could fly and higher than their missiles could shoot down and flew with big wind span. And it was perfect for looking up, too, for what we had to do. So here's our experiment that fits in the upper hatch like that. And so here it is, uh, putting, uh, us putting the, uh, the equipment into the NASA spacecraft. They wouldn't let us touch it. They wouldn't let us observe. And then we could, once it was in place, then we could uh, check it. So this is uh, Steve Pellane, who was a grad student who helped us some of the time. This is me with my hair slightly long. The next picture, you'll see it longer. You'll see the equipment go into place. You'll see our high quality uh, you know, cardboard box protecting our equipment. Whoops, we skipped over. I should show you this. Well, good, I, I, I uh, saved the picture. Here's Mark Gornstein, the grad student, got his PhD on that, following the U-2 out. This is a very interesting airplane. It was the first wet wing airplane, and the wings would sag, so they had these little pogo wheels that when the pilot was going down the runway, the, the wings would lift, and those things would fall off, and the crew would come and pick them up. And it was a bicycle. It just had two wheels, so you had to actually be a good, a good driver. And... Uh, so it was quite impressive, but this is the kind of thing. So there were two versions of the U-2, the stretch version and the, uh, the version that we flew in. And you can see the Golden Gate Bridge and so forth. And here it is flying, uh, looking up and looking down at the same time. And uh, here are the places that we managed to train it to look on the sky, always in pairs because there were two antennas. So we would fly a long strip switching the antennas back and forth. Then we'd have the U-2 turn around and fly back exactly the opposite track, a big long racetrack kind of thing. So we're looking at two parts of the sky, not only interchanging the horns, but also interchanging the whole space, the whole craft, the whole aircraft, 
so that we could make sure there wasn't something about the airplane that was affecting it too. And when we plotted up the temperature differences versus an angle in the sky, we found this nice smooth cosine curve. We picked a particular direction in the sky and we did a fit and did that. And that was consistent with a map of the sky that looks roughly like this. This is a plot from the days before we had good graphics, so people had to do this by hand. Just imagine it continuously smoothly varies with the cosine from warm here about a part in a thousand to cold there about a part in a thousand. And we interpret that as due to the motion of us as the observer through this background radiation that fills the universe. And the direction we're going, it looks warmer. The direction we're leaving, it looks colder. It's just like driving in the rain. The direction you're going, you hit the photons harder, you hit the light harder. The direction you're leaving, they, it's shorter. And you can do the calculation with the Doppler effect and you see what's going on. And uh, you can explain why that motion might come from various things. This is one we made for Kobe, but this is the same thing. Imagine you're flying out of Ames. The Earth is rotating. The plane is flying. It's got a certain velocity. That Earth, it's on the Earth, near the Earth, and the Earth is going around the sun at 30 kilometers per second, so much larger than the airplane speeds and the rotation speeds. And we're on our own galaxy, and that galaxy is rotating about 200 kilometers per second. And we in Andromeda and a local small galaxy are orbiting around each other, around some common center of mass. And we're being pulled by other masses around us. And then we had to make up this thing called the Great Attractor because the direction that we found was the opposite direction from which the way the galaxy is rotating almost. Not exactly, but pretty much the opposite way, 45 degree difference from the opposite way. And so that means our whole galaxy is moving at roughly twice that speed, right, or two parts in a thousand the speed of light. And how can that happen? Well, there has to be something gravitationally pulling us because it's pulling Andromeda and the small galaxies along with us too. And so this was something that astronomers find appalling and what physicists thought was neat, but, and so there was a struggle. And it took a while for the astronomers to start looking for the great attractor, but keep this picture in mind of the universe full of lumps as something that we, we had a hint of way back in the late 70s. And this is a picture that I uh, took. I went to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum as a private person, and I went and took a couple of pictures. It feels strange to have your equipment in a museum. It feels even stranger you know, to have your equipment in Tudor museums, which is the case now. And it, it, it even will, first took me aback to see them put a sign on there, light goes in here. But, <laughs> but then I realized maybe it wasn't obvious to everybody. Okay, we also started, and this is one of my grad students, Phil Lubin, who's now a professor at UC Santa Barbara. We started an experiment to measure the polarization of the microwave background at one centimeter. In the meantime, our colleagues at Princeton, uh, Peter Nanos, started an experiment. This is a picture of him once he, he, he left after he finished his degree and became, uh, went into the Navy, that's a big change, and became a vice admiral. And then he, uh, when he retired from the Navy, he became director of the Los Alamos lab. So there is a life after the cosmic microwave background for some people. You know, some people leave the university and get real jobs and some people stay. You'll notice that some people never get their hair cut, right? And <laughs> I'm usually busy, right? And my students have the same way. So this is Hal Doherty, one of the people that I mentioned who was is, who is really uh, quite fabulous in terms of designing and doing stuff. And this is a three centimeter wavelength radiometer partly we put together as one more stage to go on it. And we built a three millimeter one and we started making observations. And I'm gonna run out of time, but there's a reason once we find anisotropies to believe that at 10% of that level there should be polarization. But there are other things to look for in terms of polarization that's still going on. So after that, so multiple things are going on. After that, uh, Phil Lubin and I, uh, as he finished up his thesis said, we really have to build a receiver that will be able to map the sky instead of just measure points, but actually scan up the whole sky and make a good map. So we conceived of a balloon-borne experiment where we have one receiver that looks at the sky and a chopper wheel that reflects the beam either from this direction or lets the beam through, and you'll see the big, big chopper, but it's essentially a big sheet of polished aluminum that rotates at high speed, and uh, the beam either looks through or reflects off of the aluminum. And you put it on a balloon, and the balloon goes to high altitude. And so here's a picture of the basic part of the receiver. In order to get the sensitivity, we had to cool it. This is another view of it, so you can see the corrugated horn and the, si and the size of it all. It's, it's about as big as this laser pointer for the horn, and because this is a three millimeter wavelength, right? so 90 gigahertz for the people who want to do it. So then we recruited grad student. First was Jerry Epstein, who got his PhD on the, what are the two northern hemisphere flights and uh, helping us put together the, re the receiver and the gondola and doing the data analysis. And uh, 
So here's the thing being put in a liquid helium cool door. Here's where the antenna is in the window so it can look out because everything had to be cold. And later we uh, got Tirso Valela, well, and then Jerry went on to be in science policy and started off as a technology assessment and has been in various think tanks along the way. Tirso Valeli, we recruited for a third flight, which we had in the Southern Hemisphere, and he's now uh, a professor and a researcher in the, in the uh, uh, Brazilian uh, Space Agency. So here's what the equipment looked like. Here's the liquid helium door with liquid nitrogen in the outer jacket. Here's the horn pointing out. You can see the horn reflected off of the chopper uh, that gets rotated around, and it's all inside of a shield. Here's another view of it so you can see. We tipped it at a 45 degree angle so the beam looks out that way. When this chopper rotates into place, the shiny side is facing there and, it, and the signal comes in, reflects off of it and goes into there. And you'll see there's a little absorber here that we can push up into the beam for a quick calibration. And you can see the chopper wheel uh, again there. And that allowed us in flight to send commands in order to make sure it was working. And at the same time we were doing this, the Princeton group was busy. And they also thought that they had to build a balloon-borne apparatus to get higher in the atmosphere and so forth, and also cryogenically cool it. And their, their equipment arrived to Texas the same time I did, ours did. That's it's no accident. There's only two good times of the year to fly balloons. And uh, so this is the pieces when they were arriving. And this is the more finished up version. This is Peter Salson wearing his Princeton t-shirt. And you can see the antennas. And you'll see something on the end. There's two solutions to getting low side lobes. One of them is to flare your horn, and uh, the other is to do the corrugations. And the flaring of the horn, uh, they achieve by going to the music store and buying musical instruments and cutting the ends of them off and then attaching them on the end. So these are just exactly what you imagine, right? And it works very well. And we were friendly collaborators, and they let us catch. We didn't have our gondola ready in time, so they let us catch a ride on the gondola. And so here is Peter Salson, Dave Wilkinson, and the gondola with the, their three antennas and our equipment sitting in there and getting ready for the balloon flight. This is the National Center for Atmospheric Research people attaching their radio transmitter and the, the ballast hoppers and everything on the, on the bottom in order to control the balloon. And this is a picture of the balloon going up, our payload here, the ladder to keep it far away from the balloon, then the parachute. And then the balloon, you only put a little helium in the top, and as the balloon goes up, the helium expands because the atmosphere gets in, and it eventually fills up and is about the size of a football stadium when it's fully inflated. So you can see it when the, you know, when the sun rises in the morning. It's quite impressive to, to see the, the balloon in the distance like a flying saucer. You know. And uh, so we managed to have three balloon flights. The first one that, we, uh, that I showed you the picture of, another one where we had our own gondola. And then we took it, our equipment to Brazil, where Tissot Valela worked with us. And we got this map. And we should have filled in this part, but our gondola got lost. Our balloon gondola got lost. It, it ended up in the jungle. And it wasn't found for 18 months. And a palm heart poacher was in trying to kill baby palm trees to get palm hearts. And he happened to run across it and try to sell it. And uh, luckily, the local authorities called us. And we were able to rescue it and get our data tape back, even though slightly mildewed. And, uh, but fortunately, we were able to restore it. We were able to make this map. And again, you see this picture where it's warmer in this direction and colder in the opposite direction and the kind of a thing. So, but now we have a real map, although it's noisy, a real map of the sky. And we're able to see that the higher order distortions are consistent with just noise at a fairly good level. All right. So in the same time this was going on, I started a collaboration to measure the low frequency spectrum. So here is the glorious collaboration on White Mountain when it was white. Right, white, usually the top is just white, but now this was white down to 12,500 feet, the, just below the peak. And we had a collaboration. This is the group from Milano, Giorgio Cerrone's group. There's the longest wavelength, so you can see the horns are the biggest. This is the group from Bologna, Arena Mandalese. It's double uh, the half the frequency, uh, half the wavelength, double the frequency. This is me and the rest of the Berkeley group. We have three there. And this is our colleagues from uh, Haverford who are doing atmospheric monitor. And you can see we have liquid nitrogen tanks sitting in the snow warming up. And, uh, but, so the collaboration was fairly large. We had some theorists in it that we had at the beginning to make sure it was worth doing this experiment that if we could see, you know, that if we didn't see that it was just going to be a black body radiation, that maybe we could see distortions that would tell us something about the early universe. But also, we wanted to prove that this was the relic radiation. And at the end, 
when we had really precise results, we had a theorist come in to help us and try and interpret the data. But I had a, a series of students. So here's a picture of, of how we mixed senior people and graduate students and undergraduates to do things in terms of manual operations. So here's our railroad track. We have a hole in the ground with our liquid helium door. We roll in, into place. We have a radiometer that in this case is pointing down. So Scott, Scott's doing this for his thesis. I am the person who's assigned to help him do it. We flip from up to down, and we also do atmospheric scans by changing the direction. This picture is taken on the day when it was bad weather, so that's why we could take pictures, because we weren't taking data. And Alan Binner's job was to open and close the shutter. And that's because, as you know, if you stand in the sun, you get hot. But the Earth itself radiates. Everything radiates uh, you know, thermal radiation, including the universe. And if you just have this open, big open mouth door, it will radiate hundreds of watts into it at a room temperature waiting. So we had a metal cover that we put into place to keep it from, from uh, getting this extra load so it just saw itself instead of seeing the, the warm one. And Alan Benner's job was on the command every 16 seconds, well, every third 16 seconds, to open and close the shutter uh, so we could take data and, and so forth. And so we also went and made our observations from another white place. This is uh, the South Pole, in case you can't read it. And we grouped into Italian collaboration, collaborators and uh, American collaborators. Here's the close-up so you can tell it's me. You know how you can tell? <laughs> Says so right here. <laughs> right? That's how you know which one is your parka, because everybody wears the same outfit. Right? And here's the whole crew on a nice warm day, you know, where... Uh, we're laying out on the ice and standing on the ice uh, where our, liquid, our, our load is underneath here, and this is the big wind screen, and we had a pit where we could go into to make observations also. And we tried to take our uh, hats and stuff off so you could tell who we are. Uh, it looks, looks a little better on my screen, but you know, we'll see what it is. And this is uh, Marco Bersinelli, one of the Italians, and Mark Dune making observations with, at a 20 centimeter wavelength. And you can see the corrugations. Uh, we didn't use a round horn this time, but we used the corrugated horns in order to make this work. And this is an example of where management uh, matters. This, the ice there is about minus 40. And uh, so you've got to convince all these people to go and lie down on the ice in a coordinated way while you climb up a big tower and take a picture. You know? So some people are better than others. You notice this as it's much better than that. So teamwork matters here, you know. <laughs> but if you're at the South Pole in December and you're thinking about what to get people for Christmas, you know. so okay. So this is Paul Richards, one of the, one of my colleague uh, professors at Berkeley, and he's the one that started with uh, John Mather and Dave Woody and developed uh, the instrumentation and the and the te the techniques for. Uh, building uh, for, for making the really precise spectrum measurements. And here's a picture of him standing next to his equipment in a tie. He was smart enough to think about taking a picture of his equipment before I sent it off to the Smithsonian. I had to go to the Smithsonian and get the, the picture there. And, uh, but you can see they made the first really good measurement that showed that the, thing, that the spectrum turned down like the black body. And shortly after that, Vincent and Wilson got the Nobel Prize because their discovery was confirmed. But, this is the thing that led to one of the three instruments on COBE. The other things I'm talking about led to one of the other ones, and we'll, we'll talk briefly about the other one. So at the same time this was going on, as these were being developed, we were developing the concept for the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE for short. So this is an artist's concept from the 80s that shows the three instruments, two that were cryogenically cooled, and three that were outside, uh, and so forth. And it's very simple kind of design in terms of what's going on, but beautiful blue uh, universe behind it. Right? Purple universe behind it. So here is the, the critical aspects of the FIRAS, the Far Infrared Absolute Spectrum Photometer, which is going to measure the spectrum, that did measure the spectrum of the cosmic microwave background, and showed really clearly it was the relic radiation. First, there had to be a sky horn. I'll show you a picture of that. And an external calibrator, something to simulate the universe that you knew its properties so that you could put it into place, chop back and forth between it and the universe, right? But the other thing that was really critical was to have two symmetric inputs. So inside, there was an internal reference black body, and then a very symmetric thing, the Michelson interferometer. Those of you know that about the michelson morley experiment know that Michelson uh, was, the was the first American to get the Nobel Prize, and it was from developing the Michelson interferometer and utilizing it. But the, the advantage here was to symmetrize it and to make 
the input reference temperature adjustable to match the external one and to make this one match the external one. So in the end, it was all nulls that you just adjusted all the temperatures and you looked to see whether you saw a difference or not. And if everything were perfect black bodies, you would see no difference. And if everything, if there are slight distortions, you start seeing slight distortions. But you don't have to measure, you know, three degrees over here and two degrees over there and calibrate it and everything. And so this ends up making very precise measurement. And so here's the measurement, here's the predicted spectrum as a function of frequency, unfortunately in a strange units or in wavelengths, right? And the signal that you see, and here are the error bars multiplied by 400, right? So here's the horn wearing that uh, clean hat and the external calibrator with a, with a protector on it. Those both get removed before flight. And you can see by the soldering iron on the table roughly the size of these things that, that go into the satellite. And here is the plot you get on a log plot of the frequency or the wavelength going from basically 300 centimeters to 0.03 centimeters uh, and the intensity here. And here's the prediction of a black body, what Planck would predict it at 1900, what a black body should look like from his formula. And here's the original point from Penzias and Wilson. Error bars look pretty big. Here in green are the points that we labored so hard to get on the ground. And up here is a very thin line. There are actually two lines in here, which are the lines from the, fire, the Kobe fire rast and from a University of British Columbia rocket experiment that was done shortly afterwards. And it looks pretty impressive on this plot. But if you go and say, OK, there's only one temperature. Let's just look and see what equivalent temperatures they were. And sort of below the scale up a lot. Then you start seeing how wonderful an experiment the fire rast experiment was. It's this red line here which is basically a straight flat line. It was a slight curve up at the end. And here's the University of British Columbia rocket experiment, which is extraordinarily good experiment. But in comparison, it's just overwhelmed by how good fire ass was. And here are our ground-based measurements. And you can see they, they look you know, kind of scattered around. But you know, that's, what it, that, that's how it came out. And that's uh, the evidence we have that over, over three and a half decades that the radiation coming from the early universe is exactly described by thermal radiation. That means it was in tremendously good thermal equilibrium in the early universe, which tells us that we can understand what the early universe was like. And we have a tool in which to probe the early universe with. Now, the other experiment was the diffuse infrared background experiment. It was a, basically an absolute calibrated telescope. It was uh, a telescope that had a chopper that had looked at something that was 2 Kelvin. And that's a temperature which was extremely well known inside of the doer. And uh, it measured at 10 different wavelengths. And this is a false color image made by combining uh, th th wavelengths of 1.25, 2.2, and 3.5 uh, microns. And you'll see what our galaxy looks like. And this is the first time we had an actual clean picture of our own galaxy, especially since we're in it. So here's the galactic center and the galactic bulge and all the old stars. Here's the plane of our galaxy. It is clear we live in a spiral galaxy. We happen to be in it. We're looking at one spiral arm, down the spiral arm we're in here and here, two opposite directions. This is an uncurled map of the whole sky. And you see a few stars off the plane. And many, many years later, there's a, something called a two-mass survey, which I hopefully will pop up here, that's, that shows the same plot, but now shows a more, many more stars. And if you look on here, it's half a billion stars are plotted on this plot. So it's quite impressive. And you can see your own galaxy, and you see two external galaxies, the large Magellan Cloud and the small Magellan Cloud in this plot. If you, look really, if you know where to look, you can also see Andromeda on this, uh, on this plot. And so the Derby experiment did very well. And what it was designed to was to look and see what the sky looked like in the range between where the cosmic microwave background is and where the present day stars are in order to see when the first stars turned on and how much light's been processed and then make heavier elements and so forth. And it did find the infrared background and said, uh, and saw it was roughly twice what people had guessed, but uh, it's not high precision and we're still trying to understand what it all means. Now the third experiment, well, let me tell you about COBE altogether. It's got a long history. As I said, a lot of these things were going on concurrently. In 1976, NASA formed the COBE Science Study Group which later became the, the, the study team. And there were six people, Sam Gokas, Mike Hauser, who became the Derby PI, John Mather, who was the FIRAS PI, uh, me, who was the, the DMR PI, Ray Weiss, who was the chairman, and Dave Wilkinson, who was uh, a member, you know, the, the old man of the, 
of the, of the, of the uh, thing to give us balance and so forth. Over time, over the next 10 years, we added a number of other people, and roughly in 85, they were sanctified, and then we added some additional people as we got closer to launch and after launch in order to process it. So here's a picture that was taken in 1988 of the science working group, minus one person, and you can see what a motley crew we were. But here's Mike Hauser, and there's me, and this is Ray Weiss, and John Mather sitting in the background, and uh, Dave Wilkinson over here. So you will recognize the various people. We also had a team of engineers, and Goddard had been under hiring freeze for some years, and there were some older engineers who were really splendid. Roger Latliff, who took the sort of our airplane and balloon stuff and started thinking he'd try and make it space quite worthy. So here's one of the horns. He's trying to make it really stable and, and, and able to survive the launch and so forth. And John Marishak, whose job it was to test the components and, and uh, make sure everything was qualified before they got assembled. And then we got to hire these young people uh, into this. So there are three, uh, well, actually four people who were very young uh, in, in the situation that got tremendous responsibility. Maria Lecha had basically just graduated, and she was put in charge of one of the, radi one of the radiometers. There were four radiometers to begin with, and eventually we, you'll see we only flew three. And so she was in charge of one of them. Bobby Patsky was in charge of the shortest wavelength. Uh, he was in charge of the, the, the uh, very longest wavelength one, but that one got uh, eliminated in budget and other estimates, and, he, and we went to cooling. And he took over the test chamber, and this is Larry Hilliard, who was responsible for the highest frequency one, and Peter Young, who was responsible for it. And they thought it was really cool to be uh, there when we were filling liquid nitrogen because it made this nice cloud. So they posed for the picture that way. But it was a real pleasure having these brand new young people come in and be excited and be trained and take on the responsibility to do these things. And they put in extra hours. They really paid attention. They went to deal with, you know, sometimes difficult to deal with people, made sure the parts got in on time, assembled their thing, tested the, their, their equipment, and we got the whole assemblage together in a reasonable time. And this is what the spacecraft looked like the last time I saw it up close. This is the shield that went around. This is the liquid helium door with a lid over it that gets blown off in orbit. You have to be careful. You know, if you're in orbit and you blow off the lid, it's gonna, have, it's gonna cross orbits. So you have to think carefully when you blow the lid off. It's the, not hit yourself, right? And here are the differential microwave radiometers, one that worked at near room temperature, and two, you can't see the one on the other side, that worked uh, cryogenically cooled by passive radiative cooling. So they are designed to have radiator plates and coolers to get them down to where they had a temperature of about 130 Kelvin instead of 300 Kelvin. And this is what the spacecraft looked like on orbit. I saw it on orbit with my naked eye and with a telescope. You can't tell much difference between them. You can't see it, so this is an artist's concept of what it looks like. The solar cells, three of them, that are pointed out on both sides, so it's actually six solar cells, and the six-fold symmetry was important for various things. And these striping for thermal balance, an antenna to send and receive uh, telemetry, the ground screen, and then the equipment inside and the, with the lid blown off. After a year of data, we ended up making maps that look like this. So now these are in galactic coordinates, the galactic center here. One, spiral, one way down the spiral arm, we're in that way, the other way down that way. But you can see the dipole anisotropy warm to cool by about a part in a thousand, plus and minus a part in a thousand. And if you subtract that away and blow the scale up about a factor of 100, you still see now the galaxy showing up saturated. But off the galaxy, you see these large cool regions and warm regions. So cool things together, warm things together, cool things together, cool things together warm things together and so forth. Or you can block out the galaxy, you see this sort of a, of a structure. And I can give you a brief time history because since then in 2003, WMAP, uh, the second generation satellite has come along and uh, made measurements. So Pinsley and Wilson saw a uniform sky except the little signal from the galaxy. COBE saw a uniform sky, but it was able to blow up the scale by a factor of over 10,000. So we're seeing fluctuations at a part in 100,000 level here off the plane of the galaxy looks like this, and WMAP has more angular resolution, so instead of blurring the galaxy out the way we do, it's, you can see more resolution, but I'll show you a blow up of what things look like. So you, you'll be, well, I'll go one more, we'll remove our best estimate of the galaxy from both of these. And now you can see the, the cool regions together and the warm regions together, and here you'll see this cool region matches that cool region, 
this set of cool regions are matched by that set of one, this one by that one, these warm regions are matched by this warm regions. This is what you'd expect if there are long wavelength fluctuations with smaller wavelength fluctuations on top of it. If I have a long positive excursion and I have excursions up and down, I notice the peaks, but I don't notice the valleys because they're back to the normal. So I see a bunch of peaks together. And likewise, when I have a dip and it goes up and down, I notice the, the greater dips added on and I see those together and that's what I'm seeing here. I see a lot of things associated together and a lot of things associated together. It's just the long wavelengths and the short wavelengths and the middle wavelengths all playing, playing with each other. Okay. And what we believe we have here is an image of what we think were quantum fluctuations in the very early universe that the process of inflation and expansion of the universe have blown up to become things of astronomical and cosmological size. That is, our own galaxy was once a quasim, uh, cosm, uh, quantum fluctuation in the early universe. In fact, the Virgo cluster was a quantum fluctuation and it got stretched to that size. And it's a very neat picture, but how do we make that work? Okay, so let's look at the modern universe. So here's what was going on at the same time we were building COBE. First was this, the Center for Astrophysics at Harvard making a survey to get the three dimensions on where the galaxies were located. So this figure made a, a sensation when it came out. It was known as the stick man, and later on when it got a few more, the fingers of God. Okay. And uh, you'll see, see these things are pointing at us. The Earth is here, you take your telescope, you point it at the sky, and you see this cone and as the Earth rotates, it sweeps, the cone sweeps out a kind of a disk, part of a disk on the sky. So we're not plotting the, the, the vertical direction, we're only plotting the one angular direction of the rotation of the Earth, hours, you know, nine hours, 10 hours, 11 hours, those are the hour, astronomical hours on the sky. And the location of the galaxy in angle and estimate of how far away it is. We get that estimate from how, how much the universe is expanding. And so you start seeing this thing looks like a stick man. Well, that's pretty anthropomorphic and so forth. But the other thing you see that's really impressive is you see this structure that extends across the sky. This thing extends across the sky um, on the scale of 100 megaparsecs. So for those of you who don't know, that's about 300 million light years. So it's about 300 times as far as light can go in a million years. It's quite far. It's, 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 it's quite big, but this is nothing compared to the more recent surveys. So here's a survey from the two degree field of view, that, that same one that I showed you the, the plot of the local stars from. And now every point in here is a galaxy. This is, and you know, it had a half a billion stars, it should have a half billion galaxies. Well, it's a few million in here because of the issue. And they start being incomplete. So it's not that we're running out of galaxies as we look further away, it's the, they're not able to detect them. Right, there's a lot more. So this is the original CFA, and they got a much more complete sample. The CFA could only see the brightest galaxies. And so you will start seeing there's a lot of structure. You actually start needing to go to three dimensions in order to see what's going on. On my screen, I can see it maybe a little better than you can. Um, but the, uh, there, there is structure out there on various sizes. So here is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a competing survey. And one of the things you should see is there are these great walls and these structures but there's kind of a cobwebby kind of appearance out here. But then again, they run into limit problems that they're not able to detect all the galaxies out here and they start having incompleteness, right? But there's some idea of structures. And so the galaxies you can see out here are the really luminous red galaxies. The ones you can see in here is most of the galaxies except for the really faint dwarf galaxies. But you're getting a pretty good sample of what the galaxies look like uh, upon the sky. Okay, so how do we get from this universe that's almost perfectly uniform, except for this part in 100,000 variation, to the universe that has this really complicated structure? And so here's the idea of what we think the structure looks like. So if you look on the really large scales, so gigaparsecs, that's a billion parsecs, or three billion light years across, which is a significant fraction of the visible universe. Not, it's still a tenth or, le or, or less, but it's still pretty impressive. And you see it kind of looks like, you know, insulation, horsehair foam kind of, a, kind of a thing. Look a little more closely, you can see what we call the, the, the cobwebby kind of a look, the cosmic web that's out there. When you look even more closely, so here is, here, here is 750 million light years, right? And here we are looking at 180 you know, million light years or something. And you start looking and you start to see these clusters of galaxies and, 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 and interesting structure. 
right? So how did this structure all come into being? Right? That's the question. How do I get from the, from the early universe to that kind of a situation? Well, let's just let gravity work. Let's put these fluctuations in, turn gravity on, and wait for 14 billion years and see what we get. Okay, okay. there we go. 14 billion years elapses in a small fraction of a second here. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get it to go back, but I'm having trouble here. Watch it carefully. <laughs> you saw the cosmic web. I somehow I've lost control here. Okay, well, I can do a close up. Okay, so you watch here. This is a cluster of galaxy scale. And this is the sort of galaxy or Andromeda galaxy scale down here. Well, there are a bunch of sort of fairly respectable galaxies, but they're a little too close together. And they pass through each other and they tidally disrupt each other. And you'd think it'd be pretty awful when two galaxies would hit each other. And if you watch, you'll see that happen. You'll see two, two galaxies wham right into each other. But basically, galaxies are mostly empty, right? How far is it to the nearest star? What fraction of the volume do we fill up? The chances of a star hitting a star are almost nil, right? What really happens is they pass through each other, but they're tidally disrupted, and, they, and there's some uh, various things that go on. And so you see these very spectacular kinds of, of events, but you'll notice it goes through the other side. It just goes right through, right? I mean, and it comes back, but it, it kind of gets stretched out, right? It's like taffy, it gets pulled out. And eventually, it clumps up and it forms an elliptical galaxy. And if there's some dissipation, it may eventually turn into a spiral galaxy. So we have simulations. And these are the kind of simulations that you would see if you were looking out there with your telescope. But let's suppose that we're God or physicist, right? So we can see in three dimensions. OK, so now we got three dimensional. So here's a cube. And we're starting out a little late in the universe. So Z, 1 plus z is the scale size of the universe now divided by the scale size of the universe when the simulation starts. So this thing up in the corner tells you the universe was 29.262 times smaller when the simulation began. So we've already let a little stuff build up. That's just because it's kind of slow happening. So we're forming a network, a web, the cosmic web. And this is the dark matter doing this, not the, not the ordinary matter. The dark matter starts doing it early. That's the reason I started a redshift here of 28, because then the dark matter and the baryons, the ordinary matter, do it together. But before that, I'll show you they don't do it uh, in the same time scale. OK, well, since we're physicists, or God, we can actually look at it from different perspectives. So let's watch this, rot this same thing rotate. Whoops, my computer can't go fast enough. So it is a complicated, it's kind of like a dirty spider web or something. And what you see from that is some structure forms early, but a lot of structure is forming right up to the present. Right? It's still going on. And that would be true if it wasn't for the dark energy causing the universe to accelerate. We'd be making even bigger and bigger structures. Everything that's going on is on a relatively small scale now compared to the cosmic scale because the, expansion, the accelerating expansion of the universe is starting to cut it off. Right? Otherwise, we'd be making stuff bigger and bigger. Right? Now we're just you know, playing around in our backyard. OK, so here's a sort of a close-up uh, with the time scales on it. Whoops, again, my computer is uh, not able to handle it. Showing how a cluster forms. I guess this, isn't, this is the dark matter doing it, not just the, the baryons, so, so I'm not an astronomer. So we have this idea about what goes on in the early universe in the first, you know, up to a couple million years, and then there's the slow growth as the universe is expanding, the parts where there's going to be galaxies that don't expand quite as fast, then as the universe expands further and further out, eventually you get to the point where the dark matter which was staying way up here, and the baryons were getting damped out because they're oscillating. We'll talk about acoustic oscillations in a second. They then begin to catch up to the dark matter, and as you get older, they do that. And then the big way, on the big scale, we get the, the, the cosmic web. On a middle scale, we get the galaxy clusters. On a smaller scale, we get galaxies. And then on the smaller scale, we get stars. That's, it's sort of a nice picture, and uh, we'll see that. So this is pretty impressive. So I, I want you to buy this, you know. Because we, we understand the formation of structure, but I'm going to make you a special deal. 
I'm going to learn you, let you in on the secrets of all the universe, the geometry of space time, the contents of the universe, and you get much, much more. Now how much are you going to pay? Right? That's the, that's the, uh, the thing. So, but in order to do that, you have to, uh, you have to go through a little bit of, of work here and understand what's happening. So we're going to go into a coordinate system called a co-moving frame. That is, if you imagine that the universe is expanding in, and uniformly and nothing is moving around in it except for the slow, gradual moving under gravity, and let's neglect that for a minute, everything keeps its same co-moving coordinate. It doesn't move around except for being pulled a little bit in. But let's turn off gravity for a second. Everything would just go up as the universe got bigger or smaller. So we'll just label it with this co-moving coordinate so we don't have to keep track of the expansion of the universe. And so then the world line of me or somebody else or another galaxy is just a straight line up in the time direction. So now I get a freedom of choosing what kind of time I'm going to use, you know, Berkeley time, professor time, student time, you know, perceptual time. I'm going to use something called a conformal time. That's the time the lapse such that light travels on 45 degrees, right? So in a short amount of space time, if I measure this distance in seconds, I have to measure my, that distance in light seconds, right? right? And, or whatever. So I want to use a coordinate system where my, in my coordinate system, light will travel on 45 degrees. That's because it's easy to draw those things. Well, if I hadn't stretched it a little bit, it would look like these would all be 45 degrees. So I'm suppressing the x direction. So if I am in, at looking in the past, looking out, I see light coming to me. It comes to me from a sphere around me. But since I only have two dimensions, I only see a circle right, around, that cuts across there. And it comes to me on a 45 degree. If I wait a little later, I see a bigger circle, and so on. So let's imagine this is the beginning of the universe or the end of inflation. And there's a certain time period when the universe has to expand and cool to the point that the light is free to travel to me. Before that, the universe is so hot, it's like being in the sun, the light just scatters around. But once I get out to the outside of the sun where the temperature is the right temperature that neutral atoms can form, the light can free stream to me and I can see the surface of the sun, I can't see the inside of the sun. The universe is like that, except it's in time. Okay. So there are some features, right? I happen to be right here at the present. I, I, I see a sphere around me that intersects it can go out as far as this last cosmic cloud. It can go out to 14 billion light years in any direction, and then the universe is too thin. So I had to draw this thing a little thick in order to put these things on here. There are two things that are really relevant on here. If I start here and I send out a light signal, I have a cone. It's really a light sphere. It's a circle that's going, a sphere that's going out, whose diameter increases with time, and its diameter when I look back from here and compare this angle to this distance, I will find it's about two degrees when I do the simple calculations. Now, what if I start a sound wave out? That is, suppose that I make a little lump in the early universe that I want to turn into a galaxy. It will be blown apart by the light in a big sound wave, a big acoustic sound wave. It's called a photon baryon fluid. It'll make a big sound wave, and that big sound wave will move apart. And it moves apart. At the, at the speed of light divided by the square root of three. Why the square root of three? Well, if you studied your high school physics, we live in three dimensions. If the speed of the, of the particle carrying the sound wave moves the speed of light, which is light, then it'll be the, you know, that speed divided by the square root of the number of dimensions. So it's 60% of the speed of light. So I, if I send out a light pulse, it makes a sphere that big around. If I send out a sound pulse, it makes a sphere that big around. Okay, so let's look at what that looks like in the early universe. And so now I had to do a, a global fit and say, well, what's the universe made out of? Well, it's got made out of radiation. It's made out of dark matter. It's made out of ordinary particles. It's made out of neutrinos. Just a few things. So let me then look at how this sound pulse looks like if I make a little lump in the universe and I let go of it, right? I let the radiation start blowing it apart or whatever. What happens? It looks like this. It's interesting. Remember, this is a spherical surface going out. We're just seeing the cross-section. OK, so there's a lump left in the middle. Why is there a lump left in the middle? Let's see if I can start it again. If not, oh, I've got to go back one. Why is there a lump left in the middle? Well, the dark matter doesn't interact with the radiation. It, that's why it's dark. It doesn't have any interaction with light. And so it doesn't get blown out by the light. The neutrinos are free to stream out wherever they want to go. But 
the ordinary matter, the things we call the baryons or the atoms, they're trapped with the light. They interact, they scatter with the light very much, and they're blown out by the light just the same way the sun pressure keeps the, the sun from collapsing. And so, if I could make this thing go again, you see the center part, the dark matter stays, the baryons and neutrinos and the light get streaming out, and at one point, after I finish the simulation, the light, the universe gets cold enough, the light just keeps going and the baryons are left behind. There's a ring of baryons out there, right? Plus there's a lump of dark matter in the middle, a ring of baryons, and the neutrinos and the light are all scattering around the universe. Okay, well that would be pretty easy. I just gotta look for a spike like this and I can measure its size and I got, I, I've got a, I got a thing whose size I know and I can measure its angle and that will tell me the geometry of the universe. We'll get to that in a second. Now the real universe is a little more complicated it's full of a lot of random fluctuations. Right? So now I gotta do a more careful analysis. Right? So let me show you the plot. So I got dark matter, I have the ordinary baryons, the gas, the photons, and the neutrinos. You see the neutrinos and the photons decouple and they get really thin. The baryons start being pulled in by the dark matter, by the gravitation of the dark matter, but there's a little lump of dark matter out here that got pulled into where the baryon lump was left. So let me try and run that again. So pay attention because there's three thing, four things to keep track of. Plus, you have to look and see at 300,000 years, the radiation decouples. It actually starts decoupling a little earlier. See, the dark matter stays there. The baryons just begin to inch up right at when, the, when the photons start decoupling. And then the baryons are left as a lump there. And then the dark matter particles come in around the baryons. And so around my central part, around my cluster of galaxies or my big galaxy, I'll expect to see some small galaxies. Right? And this is the density one, so it's not very much. If I integrate up, I get to multiply by r squared, right? Because the volume element is r squared dr, right? So if I can actually figure out how to measure up the, the mass profile, I'll see something much more impressive, right? But then I've got to be able to do, you know, arithmetic on the sky. So there's a radiation going away. Here's the huge amount of mass and baryons out there. The baryons start falling in the dark matter well the dark matter starts pulling back to the baryons, and we get this little lump left. If you actually do the calculation, it's only a few percent. So it's a very small effect, but it's there. Okay, so now, let me go back. One, two, three, four. No, I didn't quite make it back there. Sorry. Anyway, so what I have now is I have something whose size I know. Well, I can't get back there. So I have something whose size I know out at that last scattering surface. It's 150 megaparsecs, or 450 million light years across. So if I know the size of the object and how far away it is, I know what angle it should subtend, provided we have Euclidean geometry, okay? But what if we don't have Euclidean geometry? Come on. That's the problem with these, uh, my computer. I have too many, too many, uh, animations in here. What if the geometry of the universe could be curved? Right? Okay, so there are three possibilities for a universe that's pretty homogeneous. Why do we know it's homogeneous and isotropic? Well, the radiation is. And unless we are really special, the fact that there's, there's homogeneity and isotropy tells you that there's only three possible kinds of overall geometry we can have, and everything else has perturbations to it. And that is a spherical surface, a flat surface, and a saddle shape or a funnel shaped surface. Those are the only three that have the property. They're the same no matter where you are and no matter which direction you look. Well, so you know, if you look at these grid lines, you'll notice they converge, right? So if I have an object at a given distance away from the the, me as an observer, whose length I know, 150 megaparsecs, and I look at the light coming into it, it bends in. So when I extrapolate back to the angle, I extrapolate a bigger angle. So if the universe is closed, it will look bigger, the spots will look bigger. Right? And if the universe is open, it's just the opposite, the light rays are bending in, it will look smaller. And if it's just, just right universe, the Euclidean universe, it'll look just right, because that's what I learned in elementary school. And so what do I see? Well, here's the same diagrams again. Here are the simulations you do for what's going on. And what I see on those plots is exactly this plot to high precision to about one and a half, two percent. 
So I know the universe is very close to being flat. So I know the geometry of the universe is very close to being flat. I notice the radius of curvature of the universe is at least 10 times as big as the observable universe. I also know from seeing these fluctuations and variations that the size of the universe must be pretty big. It, it can't be self-replicating and so forth. Just because I see variations that stick over such a large angle. So already I know the geometry of the universe and I know something about the topology of the universe that it's pretty big. So I'm starting to learn some secrets of the universe, right? Okay, so we've got these, these maps. We can then analyze these and look what the variations are as a function of angular scale. So I can think of it in terms of frequencies. Those of you that are used to listening to music or doing Fourier transforms, right? When you listen to notes, you pick out certain frequencies, right? We can look for the angular frequencies on the sky, or we can just look at the variations as a function of angular scale size on, on the side. And we see, even though there's lots of long wavelengths and short wavelengths, there are certain wavelengths that get picked out or certain angles that get picked out. These angles that get picked out is one, near the one degree scale, about nine and a half degree, about 0.9 and a half degree, 0.95 degrees. And there's a series of smaller peaks potentially out here. And this is the theoretical model for the universe that's made that has, uh, well, I'll show you the parameters, about 70% dark energy, 25% dark matter, 4% ordinary matter, and a smattering of neutrinos and radiation and so forth. So that's this lambda CDM model. And so this is the W map, the blue points are the W map points. You can see the large angular scales. You see it's very flat, and then you see these wiggles. They, they tell us something. They tell us the sound waves on the universe and what they're doing. I'll just show you a picture of the, because uh, I'm running over. I want to show you a picture of some of the experiments that are out there. So this is the one that gives us the high frequency information. Again, the South Pole. There's certain sites we go to all the time, White Mountain, the Anaconda Desert, the South Pole. Why? Because they're bad for people, but they're good for the equipment. There's no water vapor, and they're nice and high and dry, and so forth. So here are the leaders of that experiment. Here's what the experiment looks like. Here's what the South Pole looks like uh, these days. Yeah, much nicer place than it used to be. And we have this idea. We can make up the simple model that there is the pressure of the radiation and the gravity of the material in it. And we can make a prediction of what the acoustic peak should look like and why, what they're due to. And so we go on through these. And whoops, then we can figure out what the properties of the universe are. And in 2003, that was 73% dark matter, 23%, I'm sorry, 23% dark matter, 72% dark energy, 4% ordinary matter. We knew the whole expansion rate of the universe. We know uh, the overall density or the flatness of the universe to 2%, and so on. We know the age of the universe. We know when the last, how big the universe was. It was a, a, a 100 and, 1,089 times smaller than it is now the last time the radiation scattered. So it was an embryo universe. It's really tiny, right? Imagine when you're a thousand times smaller than now. And uh, so here is the state-of-the-art universe at the end of, 19, of 2006. We're even moving in a little tighter on these kinds of things. The ordinary matter we know is 4.4% of the total energy density in the universe with an error of 0.2%. We're, we're really sort of tying down on knowing what the secrets of the universe are, and it's because this radiation gives us a tremendous uh, way to, to probe what's going on in, in the universe. And we got more coming. Some of you saw the pictures at the beginning of me visiting uh, the, uh, the Planck satellite being assembled at, at Alenia, and we were in the clean room. This is a satellite that's forthcoming. It'll be the third generation satellite. And we were expecting that it's going to improve our knowledge uh, quite substantially of this model. Here's the COVID measurements, very coarse measurements. Basically, if you're mapping the Earth, we could have discovered the continents and maybe us, you know, pulled some detail about Australia, but that's about it. With WMAP, you do much better, but in order to get rid of the, the foreground sources, the galaxy and the external galaxies, you have to combine multiple frequencies together, and that hurts the resolution. But with Planck, has much higher frequencies. Some of you saw the pictures of the equipment and able to make much more resolution, plus it has polarization information, and that will be something that will allow us to go uh, quite far. So we have entered in, uh, for the last decade, into the golden age of cosmology. We have tremendous opportunities. We have really reached an intellectual understanding of the universe that we're trying to improve. We now are at the point where we can probe for potential new physics. We have strong tests that we know what we're really doing. And we found the public is, is very excited about it. And this is likely to bring in the next generation of scientists and technical people that are going to make it possible for us to continue this process. So thank you.
Again, I want to thank you all for coming this evening, and thank you very much, George Smoot, for giving us your exciting explanation of the origin of the universe and the evidence for the Big Bang Theory. And I encourage you to keep uh, your attention on our next in the series of lectures this spring, Science at the Theater, which will be April the 23rd, and Stephen Chu will be speaking on alternative energy sources. Thank you very much. <laughs>